We now turn to a number of parts of speech, the major categories that were mentioned in the previous talk, and we're going to look at them one by one. The first one we're going to look at is the category of noun. If you learnt about nouns when you were at primary school, you would have learnt that nouns are naming words. Well, that's true in a way, but it's not altogether helpful in deciding whether something is a naming word or not, or a noun or not. Look at the word breathe. Well, it's certainly the name of a particular activity, uh, but it's not a noun. The noun is breath, and breathe is a verb. In this session we're going to suppose that the way we can look at nouns is helped by understanding something about their inflection, particularly by the way they inflect for number. N nouns can inflect for number in, an, in a whole set of ways and uh, it's not always the same. Uh, we've got to look first at the regular one because that's the easy one to remember. In English there are two ways of looking at a noun. There's either one of them or there's more than one of them. So there are two morphosyntactic properties, singular and plural. Well, if we have a look at a number of nouns which inflect regularly, we have a fish called a snapper, and when there's more than one of them, there are snappers. There's one bee, and when there's a swarm of them, they are bees. In Australia, if you look at these, they're a kind of parrot. One rosella, a whole bunch of rosellas. One box, two boxes. If you make up a new noun, any new noun, then that will get a regular plural. That's the way we do things as a kind of default. Uh, but there are irregular cases as well where we can't use the regular form because that's not what people who know the language do. And they're a problem. One foot, two feet. Children go through a stage where they completely resist the idea of feet. And when you ask them, they just say foots. Because they know what the regular pattern is and they don't like the language messing them about. Of course, if you were learning English as a second language, you wouldn't like it either. And so you have to learn whole lists of these irregular cases because you can't predict them. Each one has its own particular pattern. One mouse, two mice. One louse, rather large numbers of lice. One child, a number of children. Each of those has to be learned. We would like, if we were learning English as a second language, for there to be one foot, two foots, one mouse, two mouses, one louse, two louses, and one child, two childs. But that's not the way it goes. Oh dear, yes, and then there are oxen. There are other plurals where there's no sign of an inflection at all. Nevertheless, it is the form the word takes when it's plural. And again, these are unpredictable. These are called covert markings of plural because there's nothing to show for it. One sheep, two sheep. One deer, two deer. Hmm, why did that come about? Well. Some of the answers have to be sought about a thousand plus years ago and uh, some of these older style plurals have been around for ages and they just haven't moved with the times. There are always little bits of language that seem to resist change. These are even weirder. If we look at scissors, we call it a pair of scissors, but it isn't really a pair, is it? It's just one thing. You take it out of the drawer and it's a single pair of scissors. A pair of trousers. Why a pair of trousers? If you went to the drawer and took out one and then the other, that would be fine and then you had to stitch them together or zip them together. That would be exciting. Uh, zipping your trousers together from the two component parts. There are other languages where trousers are singular. Um, there isn't an S on the end at all. Um, so these have to be learnt. They're just kind of weird and they have to be learnt. Well, there are nouns that inflect for plural and there are nouns that do so in a regular way and nouns that do so 
in an irregular way, but it turns out there are nouns that don't inflect for plural. Let's have a look at these nouns and uh, do a little exercise and see what happens. The word alligator, can we put an alligator in front? Yes, an alligator, not a problem. A wombat. But a Pittsburgh is not so good. A video is fine. A lawnmower is fine. But a butter is not so good. The, the alligator, the wombat. Hmm, the Pittsburgh, not very good. The video, yes. The lawnmower, yes. The butter is fine. But the Fred, also not so good. Okay, how does that stack up? Well, the answer looks roughly like this. Alligator is fine with all of them. Wombat is fine with all of them. Uh, Pittsburgh doesn't really work with any of those. Video is okay, and lawnmower is okay, but butter is only okay with the. And you can't really put a butter and put a plural on the end. Butters. There were seven butters in the fridge. Uh, well, that only works if we're referring to blocks of butter. Uh, Fred is like Pittsburgh. It doesn't like any of them. Well, we have three patterns here. There's the pattern of the nouns that do all of them. There's the pattern of the nouns that do none of them. And then there's the pattern of butter. And I think you could probably think of other nouns that are like butter that you can't count. So, what sort of a test is number? Well, it's defective. When it works, you have a noun. When it doesn't work, it doesn't mean you don't have a noun. And that's because there are three kinds of nouns. There are common nouns like shoe, which inflect for number, and they can be singular or plural. There are m what are called mass nouns, butter, sand, gravel, which you can't count. Well, you could actually, you could sit down and count them, but that's not the way the language likes it. And then there are proper nouns, the real naming words, which are the real names of people, places, and so on, and those don't inflect for number either. So, number is a positive test. If a word can take a plural, it is a noun, but not all nouns inflect for number. However, once you know that there are mass nouns and proper nouns, you can generally figure out which ones those are, and uh, their nouns as well although they don't inflect for number. Let's now see if we can put this to some use in deciding where the nouns are. This is called hunt the noun, and we're going to hunt the noun in a little poem by William Blake. The poem is called The Sick Rose, and it's quite famous. Where's the noun? Which now turns out to be, is there a word here that can take a plural? And the answer is yes, we can have more than one rose, roses. And we can have more than one worm. And we can have more than one night. And we can have more than one storm. More than one bed. More than one joy. More than one love. Indeed we can. And finally we can have more than one life. If you're lucky. So. What's Mr. Blake been doing? Mr. Blake has been playing with some patterns. The second word in the poem is a noun, and the second to last word in the poem is also a noun, and all the other nouns come at the end of the lines. Mr. Blake was a very cunning chap.